You're up. Well, we were talking when we came up. We were talking about how Yahweh is really sanctifying and cleansing his people, the inner cleansing. And it just so happens, of course, I don't believe in Kowinky Dink. You don't believe in Kowinky Dink either. This week's Torah portion, back in the book of Bar Midbar, Numbers chapter 8, talks about the cleansing and the dedication of the Levites. And that's so important. And I don't ever want to diminish, diminish the work of the Levites because it is important. But we know that that was Yahweh's second plan, right? That was Yahweh's permissive will. But his perfect will was that we would all be a kingdom of priests. I'm saying that that is the time is now, that we have got to grasp hold of it. Don't you think, Pastor Jim? I agree. We've got to grasp hold of that now. So how does that look? How does that look to us today in the body of Moshiach? I believe that Yeshua has given us the way. He is the way, the truth, and the light. But he's given that to us in a dynamic way, and I want to talk about that today. And I believe that this week's Torah portion just really is a lead-in to something so much greater. Because all of this Torah now that we've, we're coming into, that we're learning of, what are we supposed to do with it now that we're here? I mean, how does it look? I mean, this is new. We're the first generation in 2,000 years that have the testimony of Moshiach and are keeping the mitzvot, the commandments. But what does it look like? I mean, it doesn't look like Messianic Judaism. But that was something that I spent many years gravitating towards because quite honestly, brethren, when I left the church system, I felt like I'd left the harbor and I was swimming in the water and I was just grabbing for something solid, something that, I could, that looked tangible that I could at least grab hold of because I, I felt like I was drowning because I was in uncharted territory. I made some many mistakes. I reached out and you know, I got into a real messianic, religious, Judaic kind of thing for several years. And I think many brethren have looked there. And you know, it's all Levitical. Not to diminish that, but there's a higher calling. There's a higher calling. We have got to punch through that. And whenever I'm invited out here to Passion of, for Truth, I see it. And we have conversations. And I believe the work that is happening here is a different work. It's a different work. It's a work where you're punching through that religious veil, that messianic Hebraic veil. It's more than what we have come accustomed to. It's much more. You know, we were downstairs, we were talking. I love this uh, the word picture that, that was developing when you were saying going out into the water. And it's kind of like grabbing a buoy. And so we all kind of like gravitate towards your buoy. Matter of fact, it works in your spiritual life too, because when you're in a serious chaos and you don't know what to go, where to go and you're getting tired, you tend to gravitate towards anything that will hold you up. And so that may be a, a, a buoy. It may be a, a log floating in the water. It may be another person and that you drown that other person because you, 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 you're so needy and you need so much to fill you that you, uh, you literally drain that other person. Anybody been in here where you know people like that that have drained you completely because they're so needy? But see, uh, fa the Father has not called us to grab onto a buoy. He's called us to walk on the water. That's what he's really called us to do. And so why don't we walk on water when we, we are so accustomed to grabbing onto a buoy? He's going to talk about this tonight, and we're going to talk about this, but I want to pose and set this all up by saying, why don't we walk on water? Why is it that our first instinct is to gravitate towards something that's an, an inanimate object, something that, that we can see and touch and feel and taste and experience? And I'm going to say because we are 6,000 years removed from who we really were created to be, which is not inanimate objects that gravitate towards physical, the physical realm. We were created spirit beings first that are connected to that which does not 
exist on this planet at the present. We are connected to the spiritual realm. What was the very first thing that was created in Genesis? The light hovered over what? The face of the waters. So there's an illusion there that we, are, as children of the what? The light, are supposed to hover over the chaos or the, 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 the formless and the void. The, with the, the tohu vabohu, is that how you say it, I think, in Hebrew? We are to hover over the water, the turbulent water. We are not supposed to find ourselves in the water. We're supposed to find ourselves hovering over the water. Yeshua walked on water. Peter walked on water. And the only thing that prevented Peter from continuing to walk on water is what? He looked down and recognized that he was doing something he shouldn't be doing in the physical realm. And what I think Matthew's going to really hit tonight is that you have a calling and a destiny that's higher than swimming. Anybody in here uh, ever been in Boy Scouts before? You got your merit badge, your swimming badge, right? I got my swimming badge. You had to, you had to swim a mile. Well, that, that, I know, like I'm like 10 years old or whatever I was, and it, it, oh, no problem. A mile can't be that far, you know? You can just see little 10-year-old Jim Staley running into the water like it's a race, you know? And I get in there, and I'm doing, you know, my thing, and 100 yards in, and I'm already, you know, asking for 911. Where's my cell phone, you know? And, and I realize that swimming is very, very, very difficult on your body. It uses every muscle. It exhausts you completely. Some of you feel like you're swimming in life, and you're drowning. And it's because you're living in a different realm, a different calling that you're not called to. You're never called to swim. You're called to walk. We're called to be kings and priests. It's the inner cleansing. It truly is that inner cleansing. So this week's Torah portion, we look at the dedication and the cleansing of the Levites. But Yeshua has called us to a different priesthood. He's called us to the Malkitzedek. That's the inner cleansing. That's the deep work. That's the anointing that is going to break you all free. It's what's broken me free. From years for years, I was looking at everything Levitical, everything Messianic, everything Hebraic. But it's so much more in Yeshua because He's going to push you through that religious veil and actually give you the inner empowering anointing that changes your families, that changes your marriages, that raises up the next generation. It's not limited to Levitical, not to diminish that, but why go with the lesser when you've all, I've been called, you've been called to something greater, something greater. We sang that song, it was wonderful, freedom in this place. Freedom in this place. So you leave your dogma. You leave your doctrines. You get called out of the church and you come into Torah and you find, you begin to find some freedom. What do you think S.A. Tan wants to do with you then? He wants to lock you up so fast. He'll lock you up in Torah. He locked me up in Torah. Through intellect, through knowledge, through being puffed up. Oh, yes, I understood all these great, mysterious, deep things. And my logic and my reason locked me up. It locked me up until I got thrown down again. And he said, no, I've called you to something greater than Levitical. This is how to set your people free. You are kings and priests of the order of Malki Tzedek. Malki, kings, Zedek, righteousness. Malki Tzedek. That's the calling. Let's look where this begins. Let's turn to Bereshit, Genesis, to the beginning, chapter 14, verse 17. Malki Tzedek's not mentioned much in the scripture. He's only mentioned in three places in the entire scriptures. Within the story of Avram, as he returned from recapturing his nephew Lot. Then we see with one of the Psalms, speaking about Melech David, King David. And then within the book of Ivrim, the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, 6, and 7. Those are the three places in scriptures. It's a mystery. It's the Malkitzedic mystery anointing. Bereshit, Genesis 14, 17. Then after his return from the defeat of Shedeloamah and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shever. That is the king's valley. 
And Malkit Zedek, king of Shalem, Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was the Kohen, the priest of Elohim Most High. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Avram of Elohim Most High, possessor of the Shamayim, the heavens, and the Eretz, the earth. And the blessed be the Elohim Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him one-tenth of all. The king of Sodom said to Avram, Give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. And Avram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to Yahweh Elohim Most High, possessor of the Shamayim and the Eretz, the heavens and the earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours. For fear you would say, I have made Avram rich, and I will take nothing, nothing except that which young men have eaten and their share of the men who went with them. Ener, Eshkol, and Mamri, let them take their share. So Malkit Zedek, king of righteousness, he received what? One-tenth of the spoils of Avram's victory against who? Shedaloamar, the key to the beginning of unraveling this mystery of Malkit Zedek anointing, which I believe Yahweh wants to place on all of us. On all of us. Turn with me to Tehillim, Psalms 110, and we'll see where this Malkit Zedek speaks again in the Scripture. Tehillim, Psalm 110 and verse 1, it is written, Yahweh, pay attention to this, pay attention to this, and pay attention to your various translations, because many of you would be reading from, say, the King James Version or English versions of the Scriptures, and the majority would be taken from the Masoretic text. This is the buoy again. I gravitated towards because it seems secure. Everything Judaic, Hebraic, Messianic. But the Masoretic text is a very, very new manuscript. And in fact, 134 times Judaism has altered that manuscript when it obviously speaks about Yeshua. 134 times. And here's one of those instances. Yahweh said to my Adon, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Yahweh shall send the rod, the scepter of your strength, out of Sion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be willing in the day of your power, in the splendors of set-apartness, from the womb of the morning. You have the dew of your youth. Yahweh has sworn and will not lie so as to repent. You are a Kohen, a priest, Leolam Vayed, forever and ever. After this, after and in the order of Malkit Zedek. Look at verse 5. Yahweh at your right hand. Many of your translations, it doesn't say that. They replaced it with, what does they replace it with? Somebody? Adonai. But it doesn't. It's Yahweh at your right hand. So verse 5 qualifies what? Verse 1. Who sits at Yahweh's right hand? Yahweh sits at Yahweh's right hand. How can that be so? It's got something to do with the Malkit Tzedek. Verse 5 qualifies verse 1. But the Masorites had to take that and take it out. Because, brethren, it's not about the buoy, it's about the Malkit Sedek anointing. He shall shatter kings. He shall shatter kings. The first mention in Scripture is very important. Where do we find the first mention of Malkit Sedek? It's after a war with what? with kings. So the second mention we find, something to do with the Malkit Sedek shall shatter kings in the day of his anger. He shall judge among the nations and he shall fill the places with the dead bodies and he shall wound the leaders over many countries. 
He shall drink of the brook in its derrick way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. A connection. Now turn to Ivrim, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5. We're going to follow this crimson cord, this thread from the Torah. We've seen it now in the Psalms. Now we go into the Brit Hadashah. Ivrim, Hebrews 5, verse 5. So also Moshiach did not glorify himself so as to become a Kohen Haggadol, a high priest, but him whom he said, You are my son today, I have begotten you. Just as he also says in another passage, You are a priest forever according to the order of Malkitzedek. It's interesting here now because in the Greek language, it's written kataton taxin malkitzedek. And it means taxin, the, Hebrew, uh, the, the Greek word taxin, it means order. As in a sequential order in the proper sequence or array of something. It's the sequence, the sequential order, the proper array of the malkitzedek. Now, a better example of this Greek word taxine comes to us in Luke chapter 1, verse 5, where Yochanan Chamiabil, John the Immerser's father, Zacharias, was placed in the taxine, the order of Abijah. Talking about a Levitical, but it's an order, it's a specific order. The order of righteousness. An order of righteousness. Because it says in Luke chapter 1, verse 5, regarding Zacharias and Elizabeth, or Elisheba, Yochanan Hamat Beel's parents, that they were both Zadiks. They were both Zadiks, but they were within an order of Levi or a tax in. So when the writer of the book of Hebrews, bear with me because I'm going to try and thread the needle here. When the writer of the book of Hebrews quotes Psalm 110, the Hebrew word for order is debra, debra. And that word is only used four times in the whole of the Tanakh and it literally means to put in order through Debra comes from the he 